forget. There we go. Okay, and we'll start off now. Just okay. All right, I'm gonna hand over to Nick to start today's talk off. But welcome everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we've got a nice little talk um, to give to you and hopefully um, it'll be nice and interesting. We'll get some good conversation going as well. So I'll just hand over to Nick while I admit some other people. Okay, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, just to echo what Catherine said, thank you very much for inviting us to come and speak to you today. My name is Nick Wright, I'm the People and Wildlife Manager and Catherine Leatherland is with us today. She's a people office. And today we're going to be talking to you about mini beasts or invertebrate sampling to give it its correct title. What we plan to do is talk to you for around about 20 minutes. We have a presentation to show you, some PowerPoint slides on the screen. We have a few props to show you as well. And after the 20 minutes, we hope to open it up to discussion. We hope you've got some questions for us. We love questions. We love being asked questions that make us think and make us work harder. So that's something for us. If anyone has any problems during the presentation, if they ask if they want us to repeat something, then please use the chat function, which is the button at the bottom of your screen saying chat with a little voice bubble. We will keep an eye on that chat function as we go through the talk. Otherwise, please keep your questions till the end of the talk. And we'd love to hear from you. Okay, a very, very brief introduction to the Scottish Wildlife Trust. We are Scotland's largest wildlife charity. We have about 120 nature reserves across the country which we manage for the benefit of wildlife and for people to enjoy the wildlife. We have visitor centres where people come and engage with nature. We do practical projects as well, some large-scale practical projects, such as reintroducing animals. Recently, we reintroduced the beaver, which was extinct in Scotland, but we've had a successful reintroduction of those. We manage habitats on land and the sea as well, but it's important we have a very active living seas project going on. If you want to know more about the work of the Scottish Wildlife Trust, then I recommend the first place to go is to our website, where you will find lots of information about all of the different projects that we undertake. But today we're going to be focusing on invertebrates or creepy crawlies and worms and wigglies, as I prefer to call them. Um, in, invertebrates is the correct name for the group of animals that we're going to be looking at today because we're not just fo focusing on insects, we're going to be talking a little bit about spiders as well and maybe other invertebrates will come into the conversation. Whenever we do a talk on insects or whenever we go out and actually deliver a workshop on insects, the first thing I like to start off with is a code of conduct. It's always important to emphasize that insects and vertebrates, they're living creatures. We are responsible for their welfare. We must take care of them. We are enormous to them. We have great big hands. We're incredibly strong with a great big feet. We can squish things all over the place. We need to be careful and take care and consider the insects' welfare. Some very, very simple and basic rules. If you are doing some trapping, or if you are collecting, always try to restrict your, your trapping and collecting to one individual at a time. Don't mix and match. If you put a spider in with a butterfly or with a caterpillar, then the spider will eat the caterpillar, etc., etc., and it will be a whole question. So we want to avoid that. If you are sampling and you're taking an invertebrate away from its home, please remember to keep it only for as short a period as possible. That's usually long enough for you just to identify, record your identification and then put the invertebrate or insect back where you found it. It's also important to think about the habitat, where that insect is coming from, its environment. If you're trampling on all of the grass or the flowers, or if you're lifting bark, you're ruining that invertebrate's home. You're creating problems for it, even if you do return it back to the same place. If you've damaged the habitat, that's the end of the invertebrate. So please respect the habitat or the home of the invertebrate as well. That's important. Okay, that's my little introduction to a house eater, if you can call it. So, we do have some basic tools which we'd like to just to show you, which are important, which are essential to the fact that you're going to become successful and engage in vertebrate hunting. Have we got the next slide, then? Number one tool is the hand lens. 
Invertebrates, bugs, and beasties are small. You need to make them bigger so you can look at them more closely. A good hand lens is an essential piece of equipment. There's all sorts of really good, with different varieties of hand lenses. The cheap ones are pretty good. You can get some really fancy ones which have got to times 10 or times 20 magnification, which are even better. But the small, basic hand lens is equally good. If you can stop sharing the screen a second, Catherine, I can show you my hand lens that I take with me. Um, click over to me. Yep, yeah, so um, that's over to you now, Nick. So if you just hold that up, everybody can see you in the corner there. Sorry, I can't see myself here at the moment. Okay, there we go. So I've got my hand lens here. That's a Garrard hand lens. That's a times 10 hand lens. It's brilliant. It makes things look really big, very clear focus. The way you use it is you place it up against your eye and you bring the subject back close to you rather than you zooming in and out bring the subject up to you and get a much clearer control of the focus. And the other key thing is to put it on a bit of string. Always have a bit of string attached to your hand lens. I've lost so many of these hand lenses because I don't put them around my neck. You have it around your neck like that, you're never going to lose. Always, always have them. Okay, the other bit of equipment, of course, is to have magnifying glass. This is a very, very cheap and cheerful magnifying glass. It might have been free in a Christmas cracker or not. But it's equally good as the hand lens, especially if, like me, you're getting a bit short sighted to have a large magnifying glass, is pretty good. Again, bring the subject up to, to the lens, don't use it in a dark light. Okay, fantastic. Can we go back to the slide? Yeah. So, we've done that hand lenses, magnifying glasses. The other key piece of equipment is your field guide. There's lots and lots of clever things on the internet which will help you identify what you find. All sorts of clever apps, things on your phone, things on your computer, which are brilliant. Um, really, really good if you have a bit of basic background knowledge about what you're looking for. But as an introduction, I would always start with a good book. A book like this child is reading there. That's the Chinnery book. There's a really good book called Insects of Britain and Western Europe, which I first purchased when I was about 10 years old. Each page is full of amazing illustrations. And on the other side of the page, there is a description, a species description. And the detail it goes into is superb. It really inspires imagination. I think if you have a book in front of you as a reference tool, it's a lot quicker and a lot more user-friendly than fiddling with an app or fiddling with a telephone. So I would always recommend purchasing a good field guide um, just to get um, for, for ease of use as a casual interest. Brilliant. Okay. I think it's over to you, Yep. Fantastic. Thanks, Nick. Um, always good to have a little revision of those uh, tools and how to use them. The amount of times I've used a hand lens incorrectly, um, which is a shame because they're very, very useful things. So once you have those um, tools, of course, then you need to go out and maybe try and find your insects. And um, it's often easier to, to catch them or to sample them so that you can get a closer look. Um, and there's a number of different ways that you can do that. And we've got um, several of those techniques to just quickly go through with you today um, and hopefully give you a short overview of how they work and how you might be able to use them when you're looking um, for invertebrates. Uh, so the first of those is quite a simple technique. It's to use a pitfall trap, also known as a tumble trap. And this is nice and simple. And I know a few of you have already seen this because Chris mentioned that uh, you saw the tumble trap activity on our learning zone, which we'll hopefully have a look at a little bit later. But essentially it's dead simple. All you need is a small container of some kind, like a jam jar or an old yogurt pot. Um, and you dig a little hole in the soil and you place the pot into that hole so that the lid of the pot is level with the soil surface level. And this means that any beasties that are crawling along ground level will fall into the pot as the one on this picture is showing quite nicely. Um, sometimes you can put a bit of bait in the bottom of the pot, just make sure you're using something that's not going to harm the invertebrates. And then the last thing that you'll need is to shelter the invertebrates from the weather. So you can make a little lid essentially for your pot, obviously making sure that there's still an opening that the insects can fall down into. And you just do that by laying out some stones around the side of the pot and then overlaying a, a larger stone or a piece of slate or a large piece of bark, something like that, over the top. And that will shelter the invertebrates from the rain and stop them from drowning. 
there are a couple of other welfare things to consider with these beasties when they're in the pitfall trap. So obviously there's not a lot of room in there and they will start to predate each other if there's too many different invertebrates in the same trap. Um, and also, you know, eventually they're going to need to get out of there. If we were to leave that for days, then they would die and that's that's not really acceptable. So it's always really important that you check a pitfall trap after a couple of hours just to make sure um, that they're all okay and those um, events don't happen and they don't come to any harm. And then when you go to check the trap, it's quite easy to study the invertebrates a little bit more closely. You can use something like a paintbrush or a little spoon to gently get them out of the trap, put them in a sampling tray or on a surface like a bench or something. And that'll help you look at them a bit more closely. And that's where you can use the tools that Nick was showing you like the hand lens, the magnifying glass, to get a real close up look at these invertebrates and how beautiful they are. Um, and then once you've kind of looked at them and you might want to count them, um, that's really when you need to put them back. And you could try and keep that sort of handling time as short as possible and then put them back where you found them or as close to where you found them as you possibly can. And then of course, fill the hole back in that you made for the pitfall trap, unless you want to reset it and have another look and see what else comes along. Fill that hole back in and leave the environment as you found it as much as possible. So I'm hoping that when I click this link, um, I'll be able to just quickly take you to the learning zone just so we can quickly see uh, what it's like on there. So if Nick, you give me a thumbs up if this works. Can you see the learning zone at the moment? No, I was, I was thinking it might not. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna stop sharing and share my new screen. Hopefully with that, there we go. How about now? Yep. Perfect. So this is the Make a Mini Beast Tumble Trap on the Learning Zone. Got a nice Hawthorn Shield bug there. That's the kind of thing that might be crawling along the ground and fall into the trap. And as you can see on our Learning Zone, with these activities, there's a nice step-by-step -step instruction guide. So that takes you through pretty much what I've just gone through with you there, if you'd like to look back over the method. And we've also got a really nice, short, fun video to show you how to use one in context, um, which I'm not going to play because I don't trust in the tech, but you can go back in onto our website in your own time. All of this is free to access and have a little play of that and just to see um, what they look like and how they're used uh, in context. And there's also a PDF here, how to make a tumble trap. And again, that's free to download and that's quite handy because you could take it out with you and then the first time you you're doing it, you've got a little quick reference there as well. So I just wanted to show you that on our on our learning zone, which is accessible through the main website. So just stop sharing. And I'll share the main presentation again. So that's a pitfall trap. And that's one way that you can sample. Obviously, that samples invertebrates that are crawling along on the floor, but you might miss other things because anything that can go over the trap or fly over the trap will do so. So how can you get a more all round sampling technique? Well, one thing that you can do, which is equally simple is to use bug pots. And these are conventionally used to go on a mini beast hunt. Um, often used as an engagement activity with families and children because they're fun to use and simple to use. But you know, you can use them in a sort of scientific way as well. And Essentially what a bug pot is, it's it's just a little pot. I mean, it's just a little often plastic pot. You could use a glass pot. Um, I think Nick might have one there. If Nick holds it up to the camera, that's it. Um, and as you can see actually on Nick's one, uh, there's a little magnifier on the top as well, um, which is great because obviously then you, even if you've lost your hand lens, you've still got something that you can, can use to sort of get a closer view of the insects. So. These pots are really fab. They're only a few pounds each um, in the UK and, and they're really, really useful. And in terms of how you use them, you just want to scout out a, a habitat that might have invertebrates in it. So a log pile or a shady damp area of the garden or long grass, something like that, and have a look. And then once you've found the invertebrate that you would like to get a closer look at, you want to get it into the pot. And the way to do that is to use an instrument like an old paintbrush or a spoon. 
so that you can gently lift the insect into the pot and you're not going to damage any of the more fragile body parts like the wings or the legs if it's got long legs. And once it's in the pot, you can have a closer look. And as I say, that's the time where you would be looking with the hand lens or maybe drawing it or taking a photo, taking records that you might then input to, you know, citizen science, scientific record schemes. But the welfare considerations are again important. If you think that's a plastic tub with a lid on it, the oxygen supply is not infinite. And again, you want to be doing it one at a time. So if you have more than one invertebrate in the pot, uh, they do start to attack each other and eat each other. So one at a time, study it as quickly as you can. Once you're finished, pop it straight back and then on to the next one. Um, but yeah, it's a really fun technique you can get. Uh, the invertebrates that are on the ground but also those that occupy the different niches and it's great for a quick low resource technique we often use them at bio blitzes so where you're trying to use a day or a couple of days to identify as many species as you can in a particular site uh, bug pots are great for doing that so they're nice and fun to use now, another insect technique, uh, sampling technique that you can use is to specifically look at moths, um, which obviously are flying around most of the time, they're flying around at night. And the best way that you can do that is to use a moth trap. And there are several different ways that you can do that. And we have two low resource ways and we have them on our learning zone. Um, and I won't click on them just because it's a bit fiddly with going in and out of the um, shared screen, which I hadn't quite anticipated, but they are on our learning zone and you can find those and the links are there on the screen. So hopefully with the recording, you can find those fairly quickly again. But essentially the first one of these is a light trap. Um, obviously moths are attracted to the light, a lot of them. And this, this is a fairly conventional way to sort of start sampling different moth species. And it doesn't have to be expensive. So our method is very simple. You just need a white sheet of some sort and you just hang it on a washing line or on a tree branch. And then you want to take a nice bright light like that of a torch and you shine it at the sheet. And what will happen is the moths will be attracted to the sheet and they'll come and sit on the sheet. They'll literally land on it. And then you can get a really great close up view, um, just like this one that's in the picture here. And that, again, at that stage, you could take photos or you could take sketches or use your field ID book to just identify them there and then and keep a record of what you find. And again, if you want to submit your records, you could do that. So that's really nice. It's basically a version of the more conventional light traps that you can buy and they're sort of funnel shaped and you sort of plug them in, they're electric and there's a big light and the moths go in down the funnel and usually there's some egg boxes in the bottom um, and they'll stay there and then you check the trap the next day. But those light traps can cost hundreds of pounds. So this is a more much cheaper uh, economic version of a light trap. Um, and then another thing that you can do is use sugar to attract moths. Uh, they feed on nectar, so they're attracted to a sugary solution. So if you just boil up a sugary solution using wine and sugar um, and then coat pieces of cloth in that sugary solution once it's cooled down, you can then hang the cloth, um, cloth ropes around the garden. And what will happen is after nightfall, moths will be attracted to those cloth ropes and if you go and check them with a torch a few hours after dark you should see moths attracted to those and again you can take photos and start to identify them so that's a couple of really neat ways to um, survey for moths without it costing you an absolute fortune um, I think I'll just yep yeah, I'm handing over to Nick for the next technique wonderful thank you Catherine can everyone hear me uh, there were a couple of messages saying I wasn't clear can people hear me now Yes, Nick, it's much better. Wonderful. My apologies. The internet is very poor here. We have snow at the moment, so I, I do apologize. I will try to speak more clearly. Um, thank you for those techniques, Catherine. The next technique we want to show you is probably one of my favorite techniques. It's called beating. Um, it's very, very low resource. Again, you only need some very, very simple equipment. I tend to do this using an umbrella. So I go out into a field, I look for a tree or a shrub, I open my umbrella, I hold my umbrella underneath the tree or shrub, then I gently, with a stick, tap the branches or the, the foliage of the tree or bush above me. You're gently shaking, and in that way you're going to dislodge all of the invertebrates 
people are living in the top of the tree or within the shrub. What's interesting about this technique is they all tumble down into the, into the umbrella. You can then look and see what's it within your umbrella. And you do tend to get a lot of unusual things that you don't see through other techniques. You tend to capture insects and invertebrates that are living up in the canopy layer of trees and shrubs. And it's not often that we can actually get up and see those creatures. So it's a very interesting and fun way of sampling, but also you will, uh, you are most likely to find unusual specimens doing it this way. Over here in Scotland, it's the middle of winter and it's a bit cold. Um, most invertebrates will be either dormant or um, actually hibernating. But still you can find invertebrates through beating technique. If you go and look at an evergreen plant, a plant that's got green leaves all year round, a conifer, something like that, and then you go out and do beating, you will still find interesting and unusual invertebrates. Spiders very often, caterpillars overwintering. If you're really careful, you can find small beetles, um, springtails, lots and lots of variety just by beating. A really interesting and entertaining way of sampling um, populations. And again, very, very resource light, an umbrella and a stick. Nothing else, no other equipment you need, which is great. Okay, so next, next slide please, Catherine. Wonderful. We have sweep netting. Um, sweep netting is a type of sampling where you take a sweep net, which I have here. I hope you'll all be able to see this clearly. This is a sweep net, just coming across your screens now. Um, it's basically a simple net on a long, long pole, very long pole like that. And this net, if you look at the profile of it, it's got a flat bottom. So it's a flat bottom net. And you use this by sweeping as you're walking. So you hold the net in front of you, in front of your feet. And as you walk forward, you sweep that way. And you keep walking forward and you sweep back that way. And you keep doing that backwards and forwards in a vigorous motion very, very quickly, moving backwards and forwards. And then once you've taken your sample, you try and fold the net over so nothing escapes. And then you can take whatever creatures you've, you've, you've captured, empty the net out, and put it into our base. Then you can start to identify them. This is really good for ground invertebrates. A pitfall trap is great for things like beetles, which wander around the ground and then maybe tumble into a pitfall trap. But this will capture all those springtails, the jumping creatures, the flying creatures, the faster moving creatures. I particularly like using a sweep net in a meadow. You can see on this picture, you've got two young children there who've been sweep netting the long grass and herbs behind them. You get all sorts of interesting creatures from sweep netting. So one of my, another one of my favorite ways of collecting insects and invertebrates. What's next, Catherine? Good. Oh yeah. Another type of net, um, this is the traditional net that you see Victorian gentlemen using when they would go out and collect their butterflies to add to their butterfly collection. It's a bit of a different structure. It's a very long net, very long. And if you look at the profile, the profile is circular. It's a round net. And this illustration is showing how you make use of this net. It's more of a sweeping motion through the air. So backwards and forwards and through the air. You can chase after butterflies with this and try and sweep them. But the idea is, what, again, once you've swept them up, if you've got an invertebrate or an insect in the net there, fold it over so that the creature can't escape. And then you can look at what you've caught more carefully with a hand. I hope that makes sense. It's a bit difficult to do in front of a camera. But you're sweeping like this with an open mouth. Then when you've got something inside it, you just turn the sweep net over so it's trapped. And you've got your invertebrate trapped in there. And then you can do a bit of identification. Okay. Um, these come in different shapes and sizes. This one is a white net. The person on the screen has got a black net. I prefer the black net. I think it's easier to see through. The white net is a bit difficult to see through when you've got an invertebrate popping around in there. If you've got a black net, it's a lot easier to actually see the invertebrate up close. And of course, once you've finished with your invertebrate, once you've identified it, then just reverse the process, open the net, if the insect doesn't fly out, then just gently turn the net inside out. And that should release all of the invertebrates. Okay, really, really simple. These can cost anywhere between a few pounds to 50 or 60 pounds. So they vary in price depending on their quality. This one is a cheap one and it does just as well as the expensive ones for me. So I would always go for a cheaper net personally. What's next? 
Is that you or me, Kat? It is. Yeah, I'll I'll take this one. This one is sort of similar, but obviously in a water environment, it's pond dipping and kick sampling. So this is how to sample freshwater invertebrates. Um, and this one's super fun. Like everybody loves doing this. Doesn't matter how old you are, it's, it never gets old. It's a brilliant activity to do. Um, in terms of a pond, what you'll need for pond dipping is um, a net and a sampling tray and wellies and waterproof trousers uh, to keep you nice and dry. And you need a pond that's got a safe access point as well. It's really important, especially if you're doing this activity with kids. And in terms of technique, what you want to do is you take the sampling tray like this guy's got in the photo. And the first thing you want to do is get some pond water in there. So not any other kind of water pond water and you'll see again in his tray he's got that's kind of murky pond water there lining it and to do that you just gently lower the tray into the pond and get that layer of water and then take the tray out and pop it um, by the bank of the pond so that it's ready obviously on a, as level a piece of ground as you can so that it's ready for when you take your sample and then you take the net like again the one in the photo it's not particularly clear but you can see it just lying on the ground there and what you want to do is you want to extend it into the pond and then kind of sweep it through the water in a gentle figure of eight motion. So you're kind of going like that, figure of eight through the water. Um, it's often quite good if you can do it near some of the, the vegetation that's in the pond, because that will get a few more of the invertebrates that are hiding in, in amongst that vegetation. But essentially, if you do that figure of eight motion, kind of increases the chance of you catching um, lots of different things and then again when you pull that net out of the water um, see if you can try and uh, in, a, in a way cover it a bit like Nick was showing you with the terrestrial invertebrate net sampling if you can try and cover it as you take the net out of the water that'll stop anything like fish jumping back out or swimming back out as you pull the net out of the water and then once you've got it on on land you can just gently empty the net out into the sampling tray which will already have water in because you've remembered to do that at the start and so the creatures will be more than happy in that sampling tray at least for a period of time to allow you to look at them and identify them and enjoy seeing them uh, behaving in the sampling tray and it just is really nice to just observe that behavior as well as identify them uh, because you really don't get a close-up look at these uh, animals any other way. Uh, so it, with this, it's really helpful to have an ID guide handy and you can get laminated or waterproof ones for pond dipping, which um, are useful for obvious reasons. And then once you're finished, again, as with all our other sampling techniques, the idea is to return those creatures back to the pond as quickly as possible and as safely as possible. And again, sometimes if you're doing this activity with children, you have to show them how to do that. Otherwise, they will just fling the water back at the pond. And that's not the best way to do it. What you want to do is you just need to simply lower the tray back into the pond, uh, almost so it's level with the pond water. And then you can tip it and the creatures will just nicely uh, enter the pond. And that's the way you want to do it, really, for minimal impact. In terms of sampling freshwater streams and some rivers, uh, you use a similar technique called kick sampling. And this um, involves a slightly bigger net, a more sturdy net. And uh, you want to, again, be wearing wellies and potentially waders, which are waterproofs up to the waist. Um, because what happens is you need to go out into the stream. And once you're in the stream, you put the net out in front of you, um, almost at a 90 degree angle down. Uh, so that the bottom of the net is touching the surface of the uh, bed of the stream. And then you're essentially going to kick the sediment upstream of that net, not by very far, just as far as your, you know, the distance of your arm uh, length. And you just disturb the soil underneath you. And what that will do is it will disturb any small invertebrates that were nicely resting at the bottom of the river, mix them up and they'll flow downstream into your net. So what you can then do is you take the net out, you empty it into a sampling tray like the one in the picture. And again, you can start to identify the creatures that you find in there. And what's really nice with kick sampling is it's a, a way to kind of sample freshwater environments and to assess their water quality. Because the animals that live in those environments, particularly the larval stages of those insects are very fussy. And a lot of them don't like polluted water or water that doesn't have a lot of oxygen in. Uh, one particular example is mayfly. 
uh, larvae, they really can't cope with anything that doesn't have high levels of oxygen and nice clean water. So if you find those animals in your sample, it means that the water quality of the river is high. And likewise, if you don't find them, or if your sample is very poor in diversity, then you know that the river quality, the, the quality of the water is quite low. And that's still used as a way to assess water quality, which I think is really quite cool. Um, obviously, with all the techniques that we've kind of covered there, they can all be used to gather samples. Once you've identified your animals, you can enter those records into um, citizen science projects, or you can just keep a record for yourself. It's important to note that if you were wanting to do anything more scientific than that, you would probably need a more rigorous, um, well-designed uh, methodology and a sampling technique before you start. Um, but really, one of the best ways that you can get involved with science is to take part in existing citizen science projects and use their methodology. Um, and it's easier as well because they've already designed all of the hard work and you can just take part, which is the fun bit. So you can use any of those sampling techniques to do that, depending on the methodology. And it's just really neat and it's a really fun thing to do in your own time as well. Um, in terms of improving your kind of casual observation skills, really what I would say is just get out there and, and do as much as you can and just keep watching and really start to notice the finer details in things. Because once you have got your eye in, you'll start seeing more. Um, and that can be really very rewarding because you'll start to see things that other people wouldn't necessarily see or things that you wouldn't have seen a few months ago um, when you started on the journey. So honing your skills and taking the time to watch. It's just true that the more time you spend outside, the more things you'll see. You know, it's just it's just a matter of time. So the more time you can give something and the more patience, uh, the more rewarding it will be. And then my other advice is to make use of the tools that we mentioned at the start of the talk field guides in particular and ID charts, if you do take that extra step to identify those creatures that you find that you think were interesting or beautiful, if you even if you can just identify one every time you go out, you'll soon start to build up your knowledge and that will make your identification skills and your spotting skills much quicker and, and, and more effective and that will help when you're doing surveys or collecting records for citizen science projects. Um, and I think, Nick, you had a good one, didn't you, about After Dark? And oh, hunting. yes, yeah. Um, I, I am a little bit bug crazy. I love insects. I love finding an insect. And the nice thing about insects is wherever you go, you're never very far from an insect or an invertebrate. Um, you lift up a stone, you look under a leaf, you look on a paving slab, you'll find insects everywhere, which is fantastic. One of my best times of day to go out there was in the middle of the night. Um, my neighbours think I'm a little bit crazy because I go out into the middle of the night with a torch into my back garden and I'm lifting up leaves, I'm checking where my cabbage is, who's eating my cabbages, I'm looking in the little pond that I've got, I'm out there. At night you see some incredible things, all sorts of very, very unusual and bizarre creatures come out at night. So that's when I get really, really excited when I'm invertebrate hunting, insect hunting. Go out at night with a torch, you will be amazed at what you can see. Nothing stays still. There's plenty of activity, whatever time of day, but at night especially, it's really, really interesting to see what happens. I think my neighbours do think I'm crazy because I'm creeping around the garden with a torch late at night all the time, but that goes with the territory. Um, just to carry on from what Catherine was saying about the indicator species, a lot of insects, their presence or absence reflects the quality of their habitat. If you have a really rich habitat, plenty of biodiversity there, there will be all sorts of different insects fulfilling lots of different niches. If it's a denigrated, a poor habitat that's been trashed, that's been destroyed, the invertebrate populations will be a lot smaller and a lot less diverse. So insects, invertebrates can tell us a tale. We know that we're looking after our nature reserves or our back gardens appropriately if we find lots and lots of insects, a wide diversity, a large quantity thereof, lots of different types of insects. We know that we're doing well if they're out there. And insects are so important because they are the basis of the food chain. Insects are fed upon by predators. Those predators are then fed upon by a certain secondary predator, etc., etc. So insects are at the bottom of the food chain. If you remove insects, then a lot of other creatures further up the food chain will suffer, including humans. Insects are so important to people because they pollinate our crops. 
I think it's somewhere in China now because there are so few insects around. Human beings are having to go out and pollinate their crops. So human beings, where once you would have a bee flying from one flower to another, human beings are having to replace the bee with a little paintbrush to take pollen from one plant to another to ensure we get a harvest. That's crazy. We have to stop that. People are also talking in terms of we are creating a new extinction event. That, that human's impact upon the landscape through climate change is impacting on the carrying capacity of our landscape. It impacts particularly on insects and vertebrates. It's so important that we recognize the importance of invertebrates and also we can recognize how we can help them. I think the next slide shows us how we can help. Catherine, we've got the next picture. Yeah. Um, these are really, really simple ways that anyone can help their local insects or invertebrate populations. Number one, build a bug hotel. That's a really simple thing. All you need to do is to collect up some wood, some leaves, some dead stems, some bamboo squeeze it together into maybe a cardboard box and leave it in a corner. That's a great site for insects to live in, undisturbed, plenty of spots for them to hide in amongst the wood. The other thing I do in my back garden is I always leave a wild corner for wildlife. So that means I don't get rid of the weeds, I leave nettles to grow, I don't tidy up, it's messy. It may not look pretty to some people, but to me it's wonderful because I know that there are all sorts of creatures living in my messy corner of the garden. Another really important thing that you can do if you're lucky enough to have a garden or if you're out working in a woodland or a wild place, if you are cutting trees down, the bigger bits of wood, if you can pile them up together into a log pile. Dead wood is a really, really important habitat for many, many invertebrates. The pupa, the larva, the caterpillars, the emergence, they all start their life within dead wood. So they can burrow into the dead wood, insects can burrow into dead wood, lay their eggs, those eggs will hatch up into caterpillars or mites and then gradually emerge from the dead wood. So it's almost like a nursery for invertebrates, a log pile, very very important habitat. If you can create a log pile, brilliant. Also in this country when people see a, a flower that's finished flowering in their garden we're tempted to cut the dead stem. That might look pretty, but it's not very good for invertebrates. A lot of invertebrates like living in dead stems. So once a plant is finished flowering, if you can leave the dead stems to stand tall, then you're creating another habitat for invertebrates. Very good. Also native species. The insects and invertebrates living in Scotland have co-evolved with the plants that are, are living in Scotland. So if you're going to plant plants in your garden, or if you have a window box, then please consider the insects and try planting native species, species that belong within Scotland. Insects will be much better adapted to exploiting native species rather than the exotic garden varieties. Uh, we've got a learning zone which Catherine has referenced throughout our talk. A lot of things that we've talked about you will find on the learning zone. Please do go and have a look there if you want more information. We've also got um, a Help Wildlife at Home section on the website as well. There's links are there for you to explore. Have we got one more slide? Um, yes, about yes. edge. Um, this is a really good example of a citizen science project that we created. Um, this was in uh, a very densely populated part of Scotland, a place called Cumbernauld. High density of people living, not a lot of green space, um, yet everyone was really engaged with wildlife. They valued their local green space. They valued, they really wanted to contribute to improving their local environment. So we set up a scheme called the Pollinator Pledge. Um, it basically consisted of giving them enough information, arming them with information, which would help them improve their local habitat or their local environment for invertebrates. So we created on the left-hand side, we created a calendar. It goes through spring, summer, autumn, and winter. And we listed really simple things that you can do in each season, which will benefit vertebrates. We also encourage people to make space for nature. So even if you are living in a tower block or you haven't got your own back garden, you can still create a hanging basket, a window box, something like that. Every little bit counts. And then most important, we ask people to take a pledge. We ask them to say, yes, I will take an active, play an active role in improving the uh, my local habitat for invertebrates. So we'd ask them to sign up, make a pledge to say, yes, they'll do it. And then we'll put a dot on the map to show where they are and what they're doing in their local environment. Really, really simple. We give people the tools to 
to improve their habitat, then we ask them to shout about what they've done as well, to share with each other what they've done. And each little step they make will improve their local habitat and improve the diversity, the biodiversity, and of course, improve the habitats for invertebrates and insects. Is that the last one, Catherine? Yes. Excellent. The... Um, apologies if we've talked too much. We both like to talk. Um, <laughs> and insects are a very popular topic with both of us, but I hope you found a lot of that talk interesting or of use to you. Um, we are more than happy to answer any questions or if you'd like to tell us anything about the work that you're involved with, that would be fantastic as well. Anyone got any questions? Or are they all shy? Quiet. I'll just have a quick look in the chat, see if anything came through while we were speaking. Um, I think somebody asked which species of fish I was talking about with the pond dipping. Um, I was speaking more generally about fish. Sometimes when they go into inside the net, obviously they swim back out again before you can get the net out of the water. So if you can sort of twist the net as you come out of the water, a little like Nick was showing you with the uh, land net sweeping, um, then it just stops them being able to swim out. Doesn't cause them any harm. It stops them being able to swim out, and then you can have a look at them in your tray. Um, yeah, and someone's referred to the mayfly underneath, so the mayflies were the aquatic invertebrates, so they're really cool looking, I mean, in their flying adult stage, obviously they're not, uh, they're not aquatic, they're, they come out on land and fly around. In the water um, is, is what they, sp they spend most of their time actually as larvae in the water, and um, they're really cool looking things, and uh, they're pred predators in the, in the aquatic environment. Um, and they're distinctive, they've got three sort of little tails, I, I call them tails, I don't know if that's the accurate word for it, but they've got three little tails and so that's how you can identify them from some of the other um, larvae in the, in the pond. And they're an indicator of high water quality because they need high oxygen levels to survive. So if you do see them, then you know that you've got a good level of water quality in there. Um, someone's just asked a question. Um, so is there a way to attract lake insects in the water, um, like with bait or with light in water at night? Yes, there is. Um, a torch is brilliant. Take a very, very strong torch and shine it into the pond at night, uh, even during the daytime as well. They, a lot of invertebrate insects will be attracted to the light. Uh, likewise, newts as well. If, you, if you're lucky enough to have newts, um, they will come towards a light if you shine it in a pond at night as well. Um, the best way to improve your habitat for insects, if, you've got, if you're lucky enough to have a pond or a lake even, is to make sure that there are plenty of plants in that lake. So lots of aquatic plants growing there, oxygenating plants, plants that enrich the water by creating oxygen. Um, plenty of those uh, things, uh, Plenty of those sort of uh, plants are free floating. They float within the water column within the lake or the pond, and those provide an excellent habitat for invertebrates. Um, there are other ways of sampling a pond as well. You can get like a great big funnel, a huge funnel with a bag attached to the, to the end, and sweep it through um, the, the lake or the pond as well. But to my best bet, if you want to improve a watery habitat for insects, then make sure it's plenty of aquatic plants in there. And then if you want to go and sample, get a torch, go and have a look. Top top tip. Um, oh, got a new message. Oh, that's just uh, Satiri saying thank you. That's no problem. Uh, do, do, do. I don't think there's any questions from higher up the chat. Um, oh, here we go. Um, yeah, there's a couple more come in now. So, are there any other techniques to observe and collect? Um, invertebrates, at least when you have to publish a new species? If you have to publish a new species, are you talking, I'm guessing if you think you've got an interesting invertebrate and you want to identify it because it might not be something that's been discovered before. Um, if you have a species that you think is really important that you've discovered it for the first time, then unfortunately you have to actually kill the species and preserve the specimen and then once you've identified it, you need to get expert advice on your correct identification. For us, that would involve us sending it to a museum. Uh, and museums will host collections of insects. I don't like killing or trapping anything and get killing anything un un unnecessarily. But sometimes if it's a really important insect that you find that will tell you an important story, then it is necessary to euthanize to kill that insect. 
identify it yourself, and then send it off for verification to an authorizing body. The other way to do it is, is as well is if you're not too sure, if you think you've caught an interesting insect and you really don't want to kill it, which I don't want to do, is to put it in the fridge just for five or 10 minutes. That slows the insect down. Then you can take some really good photographs. You can identify it much more clearly because the insect won't be moving around so much and check your identification and record everything you can through really good photography. Most of the time, it's really difficult to get accurate diagnostic photographs of an insect. That's why if you capture an insect, something really interesting and unusual, you don't want to kill it, pop it in, take it home, pop it into your fridge, take some pictures, really closely scrutinize it, and then if you can, take it back to where you found it, would be my advice. Fab. Um, and then we've had another question, which is what kind of lights can you use in a light trap? I'm especially interested in portable lights. So the very expensive lights use a mercury vapor lamp, which is really, really bright. Um, so bright, you can't actually stare at it. Um, that's the best sort of lamp. Um, depends on your power source, though. If you want a really powerful light, you need big batteries to carry big batteries around with your moth trap. If you want to be portable, then you have to compromise. You have to have a smaller lamp that is lighter, doesn't require so much power and smaller batteries. Uh, my first moth trap that I created, I literally took, a, took an ordinary bulb, uh, an ordinary light, uh, light bulb from my house, and I suspended it over a sheet, uh, a white sheet on the ground. And I was amazed just by that small light, a standard light bulb from an ordinary household light socket. And it was amazing what came to that. So, it's a compromise, really. If you want to be really excruciating in your sampling, if you want to get as many species as possible, you have to go for big guns and get a mercury vapor lamp with a battery or a mains power pack, and it becomes less portable. Or you compromise, get a smaller power source, a smaller, like a car battery, put a smaller, less powerful lamp in, and then compromise with getting a smaller, a smaller species abundant. But it's still equally fun. I hope that makes sense. Um, yeah, I mean, it is. It's amazing how many you can get just by shining a light at a sheet. Um, we've had a few questions come in, so we've just answered the one about the light trap. Um, in case you find an invasive species, um, must you report it to the competent body that keeps a record of them? Um, yes, I think you are meant to record invasive species. And actually, uh, uh, in the UK, if you catch an invasive species, it's illegal to let it go again. So you have to kind of arrange for it to be uh, dispatched in most cases. So uh, yeah, I think it is really important that you report any um, any cases of invasive species. We suffered in, in Scotland, well, in the UK, we suffered from importation of a beetle called the Colorado beetle, uh, which which was a really big invasive pest, destroyed potato crops, was devastating. Um, and yes, you certainly had to report that, that uh, the Colorado beetle, if ever you found one. And they even started giving a reward out. So if you took a Colorado beetle to a police station, you'd be given a small amount of money um, for your efforts. So all, in my day, all the little children were scurrying around trying to find these Colorado beetles and taking them to police stations in the hope of getting a reward. That's a brilliant way of learning your insects, really good you know, incentive. That's fantastic. Did you ever find one, Nick? Did yeah. you ever take one? Ah, oh, it's a shame. That's a, it's a fun way to get people engaged. Um, okay, here we, we've got another question. So before killing an insect, if you think it's something rare or never been identified, is there a way of eliminating possibilities and being more sure you found something new as a species? iNaturalist is helpful, but are there databases or something you can rely on or procedures that are kind of easy to walk through? So maybe like a key or something. Yes, uh, excellent question. Um, my first port of call is I will never kill an insect unless I absolutely have to, unless I've exhausted any other avenue. Um, again, I would start off with accurate identification. First of all, try and identify your species accurately if you can without harming the creature. And if that means putting it in a fridge to slow it down, brilliant. Or if, if in other ways you can restrain it, if you have to, that's fine. Again, I would go back to using something really simple, first of all, as your basics, a, uh, a field guide. This is a brilliant one. It's a European field guide, uh, Michael Chinnery. It's excellent. Uh, and in these sorts of field guides, you do have very basic keys basic keys which will direct you to 
the genus or the species. Then if you need further detail, you have to be more specific. Uh, we're lucky we've got a great history of insect recording and reporting here in the UK. And there are many, many keys, specific keys, which are for specific species or specific genera. Um, those can get you down to species level and subspecies level, but they use a lot of scientific language. So it's quite a laborious process to actually get a proper identification. And a lot of insects, species differentiation or telling the difference between species can depend on something as simple as the length of a microscopic hair on the third toe on the left foot so that sort of detail you need to get into so really really focusing on the detail but my first point of call would be get a field guide get to the basic species level and then if you think you've got something more interesting do a bit of research find the appropriate key online if you have to or from a museum then use that key and really focus in on the detail. The other way to do it is to ask an expert. Um, we can't all be experts at everything, and it does take years to get skillful at identifying some of these invertebrates. Um, find out who the local experts are in your area. Yeah, I was just going to say, I um, often am not brilliant at identifying insects, and I have a little look in the book, and then if I can't do it, I cheat and just go to social media. And these days, if you put something on Twitter, um, or sometimes Facebook, if you're in the right kind of groups, um, there are usually experts on there who can tell you straight away what it is, if it's an existing thing. And then they can point you in the direction. If they think it looks a bit more special, they might narrow it down for you. And then you, it gives you something to work with and you can go away and look at it more closely. Because as Nick says, if you're trying to get it down to species level, sometimes with these insects, you know, you do then have to kill them and look at them under a microscope and it gets down to some very small body part differences so um, as a way to start asking an expert once you've looked in the book ask an expert that can narrow it down further and then um, go from there and uh, we have a few more let's have a look some great questions coming in uh, okay so can we have a yeah we've done that one so can we have a list of good id books for europe um, Nick has mentioned the one that I would highly recommend, which is Michael Chinui. Is it Chinui or Chinui? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's Insects of Europe and the UK, I think. Uh, it's a brilliant book, and it's the one that I was recommended when I studied at university as well. Um, I don't know if I have any other ID books come to mind for invertebrates. Do you, Nick, have any other good ones? Um, I, I have bookshelves full of insect books. Um... What we'll do uh, as a follow-up, we'll send to Chris. We'll send Chris a list of some recommended texts, if that's all right, and then you can circulate yeah. it amongst you uh, rather than yeah. list them down. But I'll pull out a couple of ones that I think will be most relevant to you. Uh, but yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Yes, okay, um, Nick. Uh, you can send me all the links uh, and the book titles, and I will publish them. Perfect. Thanks, Chris. Okay. Fab. Um, do, do, uh, so, yep, someone else has said, put it in the freezer uh, and then dry it and pin it. That's if you're, yeah, that's if you've got to the stage where you think, yeah, I want to, to really identify this. I think it's something new and special. Then you've obviously got to, at that point, maybe kill it. Um, yep, yeah, great. And a couple of people saying thank you. So has anybody got any further questions? Either you can ask them to us now or pop them in the chat. There was one piece of equipment I forgot to mention, Catherine, which of course is binoculars. Oh, yes. Most people think binoculars are for bird watching. Um, they're brilliant for insect watching as well. This is a really cheap pair, short focal lens, none of your fancy bird watching stuff. Um, and it's brilliant for up close. I, I, I can identify stuff with this from out the window a couple of meters away. Um, really, really useful. So, yeah. And also, uh, while we're on books as well, I didn't mention these. Um, these are really simple. They're called swatch guides. Uh, we'll send you the link as well. But these are really good, especially if you're going out with families or doing a public event. Uh, they just have a really good series of pictures, photographic identifications of all sorts of creatures. They fit in your back pocket. They're fun to use. Um, and on the reverse, there's a bit of species detail as well on the back there. Um, so if you're not really obsessive like myself, you carry books in your rucksack all the time. And one of those in your back pocket is great fun. Kids love this sort of thing as well. They were just make a fan out of it. It's all Fab. And we've had a question from Chris, which is Do you use any pocket microscope in the field? Uh, yes, we do. Um, 
oh dear, I haven't got one with me, unfortunately. They're all back in the office. You can get some very, very good little pocket microscopes. Uh, they're battery operated, so they have a little light um, and they magnify up to, I think, times 20. Um, they're really good and very cheap and cheerful to get. If you look on any online web store, you can probably find them. Um, they are fiddly because, again, you are dependent on the insect staying still. So I tend to use microscopes like that for things like hair sampling or hair analysis when we're looking at mammals or uh, looking very closely at pollen grains and flowers and sort of thing. Um, my favorite insect tool, which I haven't got here though, is called an ultra lens. Um, it's a medical tool and in olden days nurses would check out your ears so they would stick a pointy thing with a lens at the end into your ear and then look into your ear and the best ones had a battery pack attached to it so they had a light um, it's a really useful medical tool um, but also wonderfully doubles up as a great insect sort of it's, it's kind of halfway between, between a microscope and a hand lens they're called the ultra lens um, I don't know if you can get hold of them any, anymore, but they were certainly very good. Around about times 30 magnification, suddenly the world just looks fantastic and blows up in your face. It's brilliant. That sounds fab. I'd love to play with one of those. <laughs> get out there on our next bio blitz with one of those. Um, that's the last question that's come in. So, and that brings us fairly neatly to the hour. Um, so unless anybody's got anything else to ask us at this point, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. If you do think of any other questions, do feel free to get in touch with us um, either by email or you can ask Chris and Chris will ask us. That's fine. And as I say, we'll, uh, we've recorded today's session. So what we'll do is I'll send Chris a link with the recording and um, with some books and all the links and things that we've mentioned today so that you've got those for future reference. Um, but yes, um, hopefully you've found out a little bit more about invertebrates and how to sample them today. And hopefully some of that will be useful for you going out and sampling for them and contributing to citizen science records in particular. Um, and yeah, if any of you are ever in Scotland at any point, once all this craziness is over and you want to come and visit our reserves and have a look what you find, um, please do and, and let us know what, what you find on our reserves as well. We keep a record of what of all the species that we have on our reserves. So do let us know if you're ever in Scotland. We'd love to hear from you there. But uh, yeah, otherwise we're all we're all done. Thank you for your time, uh, Catherine and Nick. And I hope uh, after COVID-19, uh, I'll see you in Scotland because I'm planning a trip there. Oh, brilliant. Fantastic, that'd be great. Okay. Thank you guys. I'm going to end the recording now and we'll end the meeting. So catch you all soon. Keep safe. Uh, stop the new. You can do it, Catherine. <laughs> uh, do you want to stop the cloud recording?